Luke chapter 19 is where we are this morning. I'm going to read uh, verses 41 to 44. Luke chapter 19, starting at verse 41. It says, as he drew near, that is Jesus, as Jesus drew near, he came, he saw the city and wept over it. The city that he sees here is Jerusalem, and he, he wept over it, verse 41 says. Verse 42, saying, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Well, again, from verse 41, it says, as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. I've entitled today's teaching, Why Jesus Weeps. Why Jesus Weeps. Let's pray. Father, we commit our Bible study to you now as we open up the pages of your word. And we pray that this story would speak to our own hearts today. Here we are, some almost 2,000 years later, and uh, Lord, we are pondering these things. We look at this story, and we want our own hearts to be moved by what we read. So speak to us by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for all those who are here and those who are watching online. We commit our Bible study to you, Lord. Speak to us now by that tender, gentle whisper of your Holy Spirit. And we love you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, why do people in general weep? People cry for all kinds of reasons. On one end of the emotional spectrum, you have people, we cry for sadness, we cry because of grief, we cry because of pain, be it emotional or physical pain. We cry when we feel hopeless, we cry when we are broken, we cry when we have empathy, that is just, you know, we see other people cry, our hearts are moved and we cry with them. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we also cry for reasons that are joyful. We, we shed tears of gratitude. Uh, we cry uh, when we're in love. Uh, we, we cry for uh, reasons of celebration. Uh, we shed sentimental tears. We uh, cry tears of relief when something is finally done and we just are like overwhelmed. We, we sometimes cry in that way. And sometimes we cry and we don't even know why. Uh, I read an article on why people cry on WebMD and it said this, quote, some people are more likely to cry than others. For starters, women cry 60% more than men. And I thought to myself when I read that, is that all, only 60%? <laughs> I gotta be honest, I read another article that said they cry twice as much. So you ladies cry more than men, and that, but in this article it said, in the rest of the quote it said, experts don't exactly know why. Why women cry more than men. And I thought to myself, I read that, I'm like, I know why women cry more than men. Because they're married to men. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why they cry. It's because who you're married to. We make you cry. <laughs> there are many stories in the Bible of people who cry for various reasons. Abraham cried when his wife Sarah died, Genesis 23, 2. Esau wept trying to get the blessing of his father that he didn't get, Genesis 27, 38. Hannah wept in 1 Samuel 1, 8 because she couldn't have children. David and his best friend Jonathan wept when they had to part ways, 1 Samuel 20, 41. A prostitute wept with brokenness at the feet of Jesus in Luke 7, 38. Peter wept after he felt convicted for denying Jesus in Luke 22, 62. Mary Magdalene wept outside the tomb of Jesus in John 20, verse 11. Paul wept in anguish for the Corinthians. He said so when he wrote to them in 2 Corinthians 2, 4. John wept in Revelation 5, 4 when no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Many, many more examples of people throughout the Bible, men and women, weeping. So why was Jesus crying in this story here in Luke 19? The location of this story here in Luke 19 is just on the outskirts of Jerusalem. The Bible says that Jesus has made his way for the last time to Jerusalem. 
He's come down from the northern region of the Galilee. He's traveled down the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River Valley. He's come into Jericho. Remember the two last Sundays we talked about the blind man Bartimaeus and last week was Zacchaeus because that's from uh, uh, Luke 18 and 19. He's passing through Jericho and he's on his way up to Jerusalem for the final time where he comes down off the Mount of Olives as it just crests there by Jerusalem. And as he's coming down the road that leads from the Mount of Olives over the Kidron Valley into the old city, he pauses there on this road there on the Mount of Olives and he can see Jerusalem because you can, you can see, those of you who've been with me to Israel, when we stand there on the Mount of Olives, it has this beautiful uh, overlook of the city of Jerusalem and it is there that Jesus weeps. He weeps, he's overcome with emotion as he looks out on the city of Jerusalem. Now, this is not the only time that Jesus weeps. In fact, there's a little obscure verse in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, that tells us that when Jesus was on earth, he offered up prayers and supplications to God, listen, with loud cries and tears. Which tells us that there were numerous times, apparently, that Jesus wept, especially uh, during times of prayer, pouring his heart out to the Father, just weeping, just being in anguish and just emotional during times of prayer. Isaiah 53, verse 3, that great messianic chapter of Isaiah says that Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was familiar with suffering and acquainted with grief. And so he was a man who understood emotion and he wept on more than one occasion. But the Bible only records two specific occasions when he actually cried, two stories about when he cried. One of them is here in Luke 19, this is what we're reading this morning, and another probably even more familiar passage is in John chapter 11. Now in John chapter 11 it says that Jesus wept, in fact it records the shortest verse in all of the Bible around that story in John chapter 11, it's John 11:35. 11, Jesus wept, two words, that's the whole verse. If you can't memorize any of the Bible, at least memorize John eleven thirty five. 35. <laughs> Jesus wept. And why was he weeping there in John 11? Because that story it surrounds the death of his good friend Lazarus. And Jesus shows up at the funeral and he weeps. And scholars have often wondered and speculated, why did Jesus weep at Lazarus' funeral? And then they come up with a few different reasons. One reason could be because um, he knew Jesus did, that he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. It was a wonderful miracle recorded there in John 11. And perhaps the idea that he was going to be bringing Lazarus from a beautiful place of paradise back to suffering earth made him weep a little bit. <clears throat> it's probably hard for him to bring one of his best friends back from the dead knowing, there you are, Lazarus, I'm sure you're sipping virgin pina coladas under a palm tree there in paradise. But I got to bring you back. I got to do this miracle and bring you back to this stinking earth. You know, maybe that's one reason. Maybe a reason why he wept at Lazarus' funeral is because he encounters Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha. When he gets there, they accuse him of being late because they had sent word earlier that Lazarus was sick and near death. And if Jesus had come when Lazarus was sick, maybe he wouldn't have died. So they kind of, you know, they kind of give him grief when he shows up. And maybe because he got a cold shoulder, maybe he cried a little bit there uh, because, you know, they were tears of realizing, oh, you feel like I've disappointed you. Uh, perhaps, perhaps he cried simply because he had empathy for people who were crying at a funeral. We don't know. The fact is, we don't know why Jesus cried at the funeral of Lazarus. It, uh, it may have been a combination of all of the above. What we do know in our story here in Luke 19 is why he cried in this story. Because within the context of the story, it is revealed. We learn that he weeps as he stands there on this road of the Mount of Olives that descends down across the Kidron Valley up into the city. As he, as he is postured there looking over the city of Jerusalem, he weeps over his own Jewish people for their blindness to recognize him as the Messiah who was their only hope for peace and forgiveness. This is why he weeps. They didn't recognize him. They didn't accept him for who he really was. Now, at the time, it didn't look like they were blind to who he really was. In fact, the entire middle portion of chapter 19, a portion that we didn't read here this morning, 
just above the passage that we're focusing on, is a section that we traditionally call the Palm Sunday story. Because there in the middle of chapter 19 is the story of when people gathered along the streets leading into Jerusalem. John's gospel adds palm branches. They're waving palm branches. They're singing and they're quoting messianic passages ascribing honor unto Jesus, recognizing, at least in the moment, that he is the Messiah. In fact, if you just glance back earlier in chapter 19, there in your Bibles in Luke 19, just look up a few verses up to verse 37 and see, leading up to our story, here's verse 37. It says, Then as he, that's Jesus, was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, notice, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, when they are singing there and shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they're actually quoting from their own Jewish scriptures. It's Psalm 118. They're quoting out of verse 26, a messianic passage. They're recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They see him in that moment and they are literally singing his praises as he's coming into Jerusalem. But here's the reason why Jesus is crying because they might be singing his praises in the moment, but before the week is over, they're gonna be shouting for his crucifixion. It's very tragic. When we look here at chapter 19 through the end of the book of Luke, which is through chapter 24, the storyline slows way down because from chapter 19 to chapter 24, it all details the last week of Jesus' life. The whole first 18 chapters of the book of Luke deal with three and a half years of his ministry. But from chapters 19 to 24, it deals with just the last week of his life. And despite the fact that people in the moment are caught up in this wonderful, you know, parade, singing his praises, waving palm branches. Here comes Jesus into Jerusalem. They're singing from Psalm 118 because the Psalms were sung. So they're quoting a Messianic passage. They're singing his praises. They are ascribing unto him uh, honor as the Messiah. And yet Jesus is weeping because he knows that th though this is Sunday, it's Sunday when he comes into the city of Jerusalem just before he's crucified. He knows by Thursday, they will go from blessed is the king to crucify him. Blessed is the king to crucify him. So Jesus knows that this is all short-lived. That's why he's weeping. And he's not weeping for himself. He's not having a pity party for himself. He weeps for them because of their loss. Look again in your Bibles at verse 44. Jesus said, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The NIV says you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's your visitation. You are being, you are being visited by God himself in flesh and you don't recognize it. You're not seeing it. This is why he weeps. And why didn't they recognize the Messiah? Because after all, their own Jewish scriptures, the prophet Daniel predicted that the Messiah would come to Jerusalem 483 years. This is Daniel 9, verse 25. 483 years after the decree was issued for the rebuilding of the walls of the city of Jerusalem until Messiah came, 483 years. Now, Daniel prophesied that about 600 years before Christ. He prophesies this. He says, here's the timeline so that when Messiah comes, you're going to be able to recognize him. 483 years after the decree is issued for the rebuilding and the restoration of Jerusalem following when the Babylonians destroyed it. 483 years from the issuing of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah. That's in their own Jewish scriptures. Now, What's also in their Jewish scriptures is Nehemiah chapter 2. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, it tells us that King Artaxerxes, this Persian pagan king whose heart was moved by the hand of God, issued the decree for Jerusalem to be rebuilt, to be restored. The year was 445 B.C. So Daniel prophesies it, 600 B.C. or so. 
King Artaxerxes actually issues the decree in 445 BC, and when you add 483 years to that using the calculations of a Jewish calendar, not our Gregorian calendar, it comes to 32 AD, the year that Jesus comes into Jerusalem from their own Jewish scriptures, from Daniel chapter 9, from Nehemiah chapter 2, God had given the timeline. Here's how you can know when Messiah is coming, and still they did not recognize him. Still, they did not realize that Jesus is Messiah. And by not realizing who he was, they would not realize all that he had to offer. That's the tragedy of this story. This is why Jesus is weeping. For you taking notes, three quick points. Number one, Jesus weeps over those who don't recognize him because of what they will miss. I'm putting this in present tense as bullet points, not because, uh, or, or rather than just past tense, because I don't want us to see this as just an old story. I want us to see the relevance of this today. Do you recognize when God's trying to get your attention? This is why Jesus wept then. He weeps over those who don't recognize him because of what they will miss. And by the way, when he weeps here in Luke 19, it is a different Greek word that is in the original Greek language of the New Testament than the word that John uses in John chapter 11 when Jesus weeps at Lazarus' funeral. In John chapter 11, when Jesus wept at Lazarus' funeral, John uses the Greek word dakruo. Dakruo means to shed a tear. It's just a very gentle, sometimes unnoticeable emotion. Just, just a little shedding of the tear. Just a little misty eye. Just something you could quickly dab and maybe nobody would even know you're crying. That's the word that John uses in John 11. De cruo. He shed a tear. But it's a different word that Luke uses here in Luke chapter 19. When Jesus is perched looking over the city of Jerusalem... And he weeps over the people who have not recognized him because of what they will miss. Luke uses the word klaeo, and klaeo means to sob bitterly. To sob bitterly. <clears throat> when you look up the Greek definition for klaeo, it means to sob uncontrollably. This is, I want you to picture our Lord on the street that is overlooking Jerusalem. He stops there, he pauses, he looks over the city, and he is uncontrollably sobbing and weeping. You got to get this picture. This is not just shedding a tear. This is inconsolable. Have you ever seen someone weeping who's inconsolable? It's like you don't, you don't really know what to do. You don't really know how to help them. You don't know, should I hug them? Should I leave them alone? What do they need right in the moment? And they can't even articulate it because they don't even have the words. They're just sobbing. They can't even speak because they're overwhelmed with emotion. That's Jesus. I want you to picture that here. He is wailing and sobbing uncontrollably over the Jewish people who have not recognized him. And he says there in verse 42, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, the things that make for your peace, circle that word in your Bibles. In the Greek, it's erene. In Hebrew, it's shalom. They missed his peace because they missed him. There are a lot of people like this in the world even today who don't have peace because they don't have Jesus. There is something quite tormenting in our souls when we have guilt and shame and unresolved sin in our lives. It's tormenting. We don't have peace. We're not at peace with God. We're not at peace with ourselves. We're wrestling with this, a guilty conscience, the shame of sin. But when we come into a relationship with Jesus and by faith we accept him and his forgiveness, the forgiveness that comes from Jesus brings a peace with it unlike anything else this world can offer. Unlike anything else this world can offer. This is exactly the reason why Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I give unto you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, 
give I unto you. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 14, 27. Why did he say this? He said this because he realized he came to give a peace to us that the world cannot offer, they cannot deliver. Because the peace that Jesus offers is what comes as a result of knowing him and knowing forgiveness and being in right relationship with God. There's nothing more peaceful than that. Just knowing that your sins are forgiven, your heart is cleansed, you're right with God. And oh, the wonder of God's peace that comes into our hearts and floods our souls when we are right with him. There's nothing like it. In 1863, the Civil War was raging and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was a famous poet at the time. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that in addition to being a famous poet, that Longfellow was also someone who wrote a famous Christmas carol. And it was born out of his own despair, his own lack of peace. He had been widowed once already, and then his second wife tragically died when her hoop skirt brushed up against a candle caught on fire. She burned to death. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, in an attempt to save his wife's life, tried to smother her body with his own to extinguish the flames, and in the process, he himself received such severe burns that he ended up in the hospital so uh, uh, injured by his burns that he couldn't even go to his wife's funeral. This is Longfellow's story. Right after that happened, and he barely had recovered, his son, a Union soldier, was shot and sent home to recover. And as Longfellow sat by his son's bed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, it was Christmas Day, helping to nurse his son back to health. He himself, again, just barely recovered from the burns. And while sitting there by his son's bed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he heard the nearby church bells ringing on Christmas Day. And he wrote this Christmas carol. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. And Longfellow, in that moment, he said, despite my own despair, I know that my peace is in the Lord because this world can offer it. This world is messed up. This world is falling apart. How much more so our world as well. Our peace comes from knowing Jesus. Listen to me. Do not miss the time of God's coming to you. Number two, Jesus weeps over those who have rejected him because of what he knows is coming. Look at verses 43 and 44. Jesus said, For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an, an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Now he's, he's prophesying about something here. In fact, he kind of repeats the same words. Go further. Look, look in Luke 21. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 21, just a couple chapters over. He emphasizes the same thing in Luke 21, verses 5 and 6. Verse 5, Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, verse 6, These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. A little bit further down in the same chapter, look at verse 20. Jesus said, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. What's he talking about here? Starting back in chapter 19, when he weeps over Jerusalem, part of what he says here is this indictment. He says, because you did not recognize the time of my coming to you. He said, there are going to come days where an army is going to advance against you. They're going to turn every stone of the Temple Mount 
upside down, not a stone will be left upon another. What he's referring to is when the Roman armies will come in 70 AD and completely destroy the temple and the temple mount. And they will throw the stones down off of the Temple Mount area, down onto street level. It'll be just 38 years after Jesus said those words. There's going to be a time when armies will come and not stone, one stone will be left upon another. They couldn't imagine this. They're looking at this beautiful edifice that had taken decades to build. And King Herod was a part of overseeing the renovation of the temple and Jesus is standing there saying, yeah, we'll get a good look because in, in just a little while, all that you see here is going to become rubble. Josephus, who was the first century historian, he was also a Jew, but he was hired by the Roman government to record history. Josephus was an eyewitness of when the Romans came and besieged Jerusalem. And he would record, he would write that in the course of the Roman armies coming and besieging Jerusalem, 1.1 million Jews would die. And 97,000 more would become slaves of the Roman Empire. The war of the Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire would actually begin around 66 AD and last until 73 AD. It would culminate in the final standoff that a few Jews had managed to um, continue to prolong their lives on top of Masada down by the Dead Sea. It's a place where we go when we tour Israel. And it was one of Herod's old uh, palaces that we don't even know for sure if Herod ever actually occupied it. But up on top of this mountain, uh, a final group of Jews tried to survive until the Romans finally besieged it. And the last of the Romans died on top of Mount Masada. Even today, the IDF does training on top of Mount Masada. And it was the last remnant of where the Jews survived that conflict between 66 and 73 AD. 1.1 million Jews died, 97,000 more became slaves. When you go to Israel, you can see this scene right in Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. On the picture, to the right of the picture, is the stone wall that makes up part of the western wall of the Temple Mount area. So this goes up a couple stories, and then the Temple Mount was above that. And what looks like rubble in the streets, those are actually the original stones from the Temple Mount that the Roman army threw off down below to what is the original pavement stones, street level, at the time of Jesus. Those are the stones that still remain. The Israelis have kept them there as a lasting memorial to remember what the Roman army did when they besieged Jerusalem in 70 AD. And more than what the Israelis think about these stones, we know that it is an indictment against those who rejected Jesus because these stones were the fulfillment of his prophetic words. And unfortunately, they are linked to their refusal to recognize Jesus because in verse 44, Jesus connects the two. The Roman invasion was directly linked to their rejection of Jesus as a form of God's judgment because Jesus connects it at the end of verse 44 when he says that these things will happen, notice, because you did not know the time of your visitation, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming. But the tragedy is, part of the weeping of Jesus is because it was all avoidable. God's judgment is avoidable. That's what's so tragic about this story. That's what's so tragic about our story when we too reject Jesus. Because the fact is that judgment comes. What happens here in Luke 19 is just like this microcosm. It's a picture of here's what happens when Jesus reveals himself to people, but people refuse him, reject him, and therefore they suffer loss because of what he has to offer in terms of forgiveness and peace. And by the way, those who reject Jesus and don't recognize Jesus will suffer consequences. That's what this picture in Luke 19 is painting for us so that we would take warning to realize, listen, God's heart breaks over people who don't receive him and recognize him. And yet none of us has to suffer the consequences for our own sin if we would believe that Jesus is who he said he was. The Bible says in Ezekiel 33, 11, God says, as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's what God wants. 
The judgment intended for us, the punishment intended for us was placed on Jesus. He died on a cross so that we wouldn't have to face the consequences for our sins. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. In Jeremiah 31, 3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have led you with cords of kindness. The greatest demonstration of God's love for, th for the human race was when he gave his son Jesus to die on a cross. So that by the death of Jesus, if we put our faith and trust in his finished work as the innocent one who died for us, the guilty ones, we can have our sins forgiven and know the peace that passes all understanding that floods our souls because that's only something God can do. Otherwise, we face judgment that we don't have to face because God paid the price for us with the sacrifice of His Son. Is anybody thankful for that? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And it brings us to the last point, number three. Jesus still longs for us to recognize Him today because the heart of God still breaks over people who don't see Him even though He has revealed Himself to them in different ways. When you look back over the course of your life, and I'm speaking to both those of you who say that you are a believer in Jesus, you put your faith and trust in Him, and those of you who say, I've never made that decision. I don't care who you are. When you look back over the course of your life, I ask you, are there times looking back that you realize that was probably God? In that moment, in that situation, in those situations, plural, that was probably God. That was God trying to reveal himself to me. That was God showing himself to me in some way. Not necessarily visibly like you could see him necessarily, but I'm talking about in the different outcomes of things that happened that weren't just coincidental. Perhaps those were times when God was trying to help you to see him. And I wonder, ask yourself, how many ways and in how many times did God try to get your attention? And is he trying to get your attention even now? Because I don't think you're here in this Bible study by accident, or those of you watching online, or people who will listen to this later. I don't think it's by accident that Jesus is still one more time knocking on the door of your heart saying, do you see me? I'm like standing right here. I'm wooing you. I'm calling you. I love you. I want a relationship with you. Do not miss the time of my coming to you. There was a whole generation of people who missed the time of God's coming. They didn't recognize it. The great number of Jewish people in Jesus' day rejected him. They did not recognize him as Messiah, despite the fact that he had fulfilled more than 300 prophecies of the Old Testament. Despite the fact that Daniel and Nehemiah talks about the timeline even when Jesus would come into Jerusalem in 32 AD, they still didn't see him. Despite the fact he's doing miracle after miracle, they still didn't see him. Well, how many times and in how many ways did Jesus have to work in our lives to get our attention? He's patient with us, but he wants a relationship with us so that we won't miss out on his peace, nor would we have to suffer the consequences because of our sin. He wants you to know his peace, the kind of peace that comes from a relationship with him. And he wants you to know what it means to escape judgment because he paid the price on the cross. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? Meaning, do you have a relationship with him? Please do not miss the time of God's coming to you. Let's pray. Lord, you've overheard this is your story, and so we, we thank you that you've preserved it in the pages of your word as a, as a picture for us so that we can take note and learn from their example. There you were right in front of them, and yet many of them, most of them, did not recognize you. We're thankful for the ones who did because they, become, they became the seed of the church, and here we are a couple thousand years later as a result of just that early church, the early ones who followed you, the ones who saw you and recognized you for who you are. And I pray today for those who are hearing this Bible study right here now or later, who have never made a decision for you to trust you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray, would you please open the eyes of their heart that they would see you today. Would you please open their mind and their heart together that they might believe and receive you? How many ways have you been trying to get their attention? 
And we don't know how many more opportunities we might have. Today is the day. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So I pray for those who don't know you, who want to know you today, Lord, as we invite them to receive you as Savior, move in their hearts right now, Lord. Move in their hearts to believe you and to receive you. And I'm going to pause in my prayer, still with your heads bowed, and I just want to invite you to receive Christ as your Savior today. You know, the Bible says he came among his own and his own received him not. Well, a few did. And that few grew and grew and grew until now there are followers of Christ all around the world. And people who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior know then the forgiveness that comes through a relationship with him, the peace that comes that this world cannot offer, and the joy in knowing that I don't have to suffer the consequences for my sins. That God has opened heaven wide to all those who believe in Jesus and receive him as Lord and Savior. Do you know him today? Because if you don't, I want to invite you right now, receive him. And I'm going to lead in a word of prayer. And if it's your desire to receive Jesus as your Savior, then I want to encourage you, pray this prayer with me. You can just whisper it right where you are. I'll go slowly enough so you can pray it with me. And just open your heart to Jesus today. Receive him as Lord and Savior. So you can pray this simple prayer with me. I'm going to lead slowly. Just pray it where you are. Just say, Lord Jesus. Even watching online, pray this with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, how I thank you that you love me so much that you came to earth to die for sinners like me. You came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I admit I've been lost for a long time. But today I'm coming home. I'm coming home to you because I believe in you as my Lord and Savior that you died on a cross for my sins so that I wouldn't have to be judged for my sins. You took the consequence. You paid the price. So I thank you, Jesus, for loving me and dying for me. And I invite you into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Come into my life today, Lord. I renounce my old ways. I receive you as my Lord and Savior by faith because I want to recognize the time that you came to me and saved me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now listen to me before you're dismissed. We always like to give out Bibles to people who receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Last week, I gave a similar invitation for you online viewers. The invitation is for you too. We mailed out over 60 Bibles to people online who received Christ last week. Yeah, praise God. And we want to do the same today. If you prayed that prayer with me a moment ago, there's going to be pastors down front here to hand out Bibles. Just to remember today's decision by receiving a Bible. We don't want anything from you. It's our gift for you to remember the decision. Same goes for our online viewers again. If you want to text the number 703-844-9969, just say, I've decided. Or if you're watching on our homepage, you could just click the I have decided button and we'll mail you a Bible and we'll uh, include you with everybody here as well. Because why? God still saves us from our sins and redeems our lives and crowns us with joy and grace. Amen? Amen. Praise God. God bless you all. Have a good day.